there were three three books that I did on the decline of the American Empire. Mm, in 2000, a book called uh, Twilight of American Culture. 2006 was Dark Ages America. And now uh, this year, uh, two weeks ago actually, um, Why America Failed. Uh, however, I do want to say and th that in the I moved to Mexico after I wrote Dark Ages America, and soon after, I was asked to uh, be a, the contri a contributing columnist to two kind of literary publications in Mexico. And so for three years, I did one article for one of them every three months and the other every month. And finally, after that time, I said, why don't I do a book of articles? It was the first time I did a collection of essays. Uh, that was published about a year ago under the title, A Question of Values. And I mention that because this talk really is situated between uh, this book, the essay collection, and Why America Failed. I won't be reading directly from Why America Failed, but I can if you want. And also in the question and answer period, you might have you know, questions to raise about Why America Failed, and we can do that. But this, this book is situated somewhere, this talk is situated somewhere between the two. I also wanted to mention this or recommend it because um, it turns out there's material in the essay collection that's not in any of the other three books. And it's kind of important to get the whole picture in that what I talk about a lot in those essays uh, is the unconscious programming that directs Americans without their realizing it. And once you realize that what's been going on, um, I mean, you can see it in these so-called presidential debates, you know, or, uh, what Obama says and what basically Americans on a daily basis say to each other and the way they behave is that we're largely a collection of marionettes on strings. And those strings are being pulled from the late 16th century, which is what Why America Failed is about. It's very old programming. It's 400 years old. And um, with that, I would have to say that, um, you know, the chances of turning this situation around as a result is just about negative infinity, you know. Being generous, you know. That's right, yeah. Okay, the title of this talk is The Way We Live Today. Despite the great pressure to conform in the United States, to celebrate the U.S. as the best system in the world, uh, the nation does not lack for critics. The last two decades have seen numerous works criticizing U.S. foreign policy, U.S. domestic policy, in particular the economy, the American educational system, the court system, the military, media, corporate influence over American life, and so on. I've learned a lot from reading these books, um, but two things in particular, at least in my view, are lacking um, and have a very hard time making it into the public eye, partly because Americans are not trained to think in a holistic or synthetic fashion, and partly because the sort of analysis I have in mind is too close to the bone. It's too difficult for Americans to hear. Even, it's not a question of IQ. It's a kind of ontological basis. You know, it's primal. You know. um, the first thing that these works lack is an integration of the various factors that are tearing the nation apart. In other words, these studies are institution specific. You can read uh, works on how the educational system doesn't work, uh, problems with the military, the economy, and so on. All that's typical. Um, it's also uh, the case, uh, the second thing I find lacking is a relationship to the culture at large, that is to the values and behaviors of Americans on a daily basis. Um, as a result, for me, these critiques are rather superficial. They don't really go to the root of the problem. The avoidance involved enables the work to be optimistic and that places them, in fact, in the American mainstream. The authors often conclude their studies with practical recommendations as to how the particular institutional dysfunctions can be rectified. As a result, they're not much of a threat. Um, they, it's usually a mechanical analysis with a mechanical solution. If the authors were to realize that these problems don't exist in a vacuum, but are related to all the other problems and are finally rooted in the nature of American culture itself, in its DNA, so to speak, um, the prognosis would not be so rosy, I don't think. Uh, two examples for me, I mean, there are many one could take, but two examples for me are Michael Moore and Noam Chomsky. Uh, 
Now, I admire them greatly. They've done a lot to raise uh, domestic awareness in the U.S. of what's going on to show that domestic, uh, foreign and domestic policy are both wrong-headed and headed in the wrong direction, dead ends, whatever. But both of these writers assume that the problem is coming from the top. In other words, from the Pentagon and the corporations. That's basically the assumption they have. Uh, that's partly true, of course. I mean, I don't deny that. But the problem for me is that it rests on a theory of false consciousness. In other words, the belief is that these institutions have pulled a wool over the eyes of the average American. And so the solution that, that, that basically the average citizen is ultimately rational and well-intentioned. You know, I don't know who they've been talking to. But, you know, it's, um, maybe they haven't been talking to anybody and that's the problem. I don't know. But um, the idea is if you pull the wool away from the eyes, off the, the eyes of these, you know, deluded individuals, the citizenry will spontaneously awaken. Uh, it will commit itself to some sort of populist in the case of Moore, or in the case of Chomsky, democratic socialist vision. Um, is that happening with Occupy Wall Street? That's something we might want to discuss. What is going on and what is the significance of that? Um, but my question is, what if it turns out that the wool is the eyes? Ah, different story, you know? Um, yeah, right, right, you know? Um, the so-called average citizen, as far as I can make out in the United States, really does want to uh, quote Janis Joplin, a Mercedes-Benz. I mean, that's, that's the great American dream. And is probably grateful to corporations for supplying us with the oceans of consumer goods, to the Pentagon for protecting us from those awful Arabs lurking in the Middle East, you know. Um, so then, if you see that, then the possibilities of fundamental change appear to be quite small because uh, what would be called for in that case is a completely different set of institutions and a very different type of culture, and I, I doubt there's much chance of that occurring. Um, even in the case of the Wall Street protests, we have to say, what's the aim of that? You know, um, America is, is what it is. You know. um, surveying that critical scene then, I find very few writers who see things synthetically or as an integrated whole and who further relate this to the nature of American culture itself. That being said, there are a few. Um, I'm thinking of Sack van Berkovich, who wrote The Puritan Origins of the American Self, or Chris Hedges, who wrote War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning, or Walter Hickson, uh, The Myth of American Diplomacy. And the titles, I think, are very revealing. It's also the case that a few eminent historians come to mind. Um, C. Van Woodward, William Appleman Williams, David Potter, Jackson Lears. There are those who are radical in the sense of going down to the root of things. They're not many, but they do exist. Um, Berkovich, for example, is a Canadian who taught for decades uh, uh, American studies at Harvard. And he argues that as early as 1630, the colonists were imbued with the idea that they were establishing a new nation under the direction of providence and reenacting the drama of the exodus in the Old Testament. And so crossing the Atlantic was equivalent to crossing the River Jordan. Uh, they were entering the New World, Canaan, flowing with milk and honey. Um, they rejected the decadence of England and Europe in general, that is ancient Egypt. And they established the new order, the new Jerusalem, and all of this in accordance with God's will. Walter Hickson, a historian, I think, at the University of Akron, um, claims that American identity originally coalesced around the idea of the other, whoever it was, as being savage. And thus that our identity has always been based on war. Um, we never really negotiated anything with anyone, as other nations found out, usually too late. Um, Chris Hedges amplifies this notion by arguing that war gives Americans a reason for being, a meaning to their lives. All of this, to me, is much more sophisticated than some theory of false consciousness, uh, some belief that Americans are fundamentally well-intentioned and rational, and just a question of removing the wool from their eyes. It, instead, it essentially argues that we are, and have been since our earliest days, hopelessly neurotic, and that the belief that we can pursue a truly different path at this stage in the game 
is quite diluted and would require yanking out the American psyche by its roots. Ain't going to happen. Okay. I like to think that I fall in this latter, you know, category of historian only because I think that it's this version of American history that's faithful to reality. There are a number of themes, you know, we could get into at this point, and I've examined uh, some of them in, in the trilogy I wrote on the American Empire. Um, but uh, you don't want me speaking for 12 or 14 hours, I'm sure. Um, so let me just take one idea, okay, and elaborate on that. Uh, there's an essay in this collection, A Question of Values, called Locating the Enemy. And in that essay, I take an idea from Hegel, that of negative identity, by which Hegel did not mean a bad identity. He meant reactive. That is to say, a negative identity is one that's formed in opposition to something or someone else. Uh, it enables you to develop very strong ego boundaries always pushing against an enemy, but since it's formed against opposition, says Hegel, it has no real content. You know, it's just basically form. As a result, it looks strong, but it's actually weak because its um, self-definition is relational. What would a master be, says Hegel, in a very famous passage in his work, what would a master be without a slave? Take away the slave, the master would have nothing to define himself by. So what I argue is that this concept of negative identity applies particularly well to the history of the American continent. Opposition in whatever form provided the colonists with a guiding narrative that enabled them to make sense of their lives. And since, as Berkovich easily demonstrates, this was a religious narrative, as we just talked about from the Exodus, it didn't take much to turn that into a Manichaean one in which the enemy, whoever he was, was the darkest of the dark. Uh, the target of this self-righteous hatred has metamorphosed over time. Is that a word, metamorphosed? Can I say that? Um, but the form, that of Manichaean opposition, has remained the same. So Native Americans were quickly seen as little more than savages, an obstacle to, quote, civilization, and treated accordingly. Every Thanksgiving, like what is coming up, we all sit down, carve up a turkey, and celebrate the genocide and near extinction of an entire indigenous people past the squash. Okay. The next target was the British, which surfaced during the American Revolution, although this was already present, obviously, when the pilgrims left for America in 1620. Britain was decadent and corrupt in the view of the colonists, hierarchical, organic, while we, citizens of the future United States, were essentially not British, not European, but rather Republican, that is to say, anti-monarchical. The terror and brutality that was visited upon the Loyalists, which you should know was nearly a half a million people at that time. That is roughly 30% of the population on the continent. Uh, those who did not go along with this simpl simplistic black and white agenda almost never gets discussed in American history books. It doesn't Canadian ones, it doesn't British ones, but never in American ones, or rarely. Um, but it has been recorded. Um, constant intimidation, tarring and feathering, uh, confiscation or burning of property, being driven from their homes, frequently murdered as, quote, traitors. The most recent study, and probably most comprehensive, is called Liberty's Exiles. It's by Maya Jasonoff, and probably they have it somewhere upstairs. Um, there are very few American books in this genre because they violate the myth of American innocence, which is very important for Americans in their own minds. Um, moving right along, we come to Mexico in 1846-48. Uh, this involved provoking a fo phony war and then stealing more than half of the entire country. Remember the Alamo. Uh, as in the case of the American Indians, it was convenient to cast the Mexican people as ignorant and undeveloped, as savages of some sort, lacking the go-go energy of U.S. capitalism. And frankly, that stereotype persists down to the present day. Um, just read the American papers about, um, you know, drug crimes and all that sort of stuff. It's like 10% of what's going on in Mexico, if that, you know. Um, uh, but that's, that's the way that the United States likes to see Mexico. Um, as in the case of the Native Americans, Mexico, Mexicans were seen as being in the way of progress, and I use that word in quotes, um, American, of American manifest destiny, again, again ordained by God. 
The truth is that the Mexican government was quite aware of who they were dealing with. Uh, in the late 1820s, a Mexican commission wrote a uh, secret report saying that Americans were, quote, an ambitious people, always ready to encroach upon their neighbors without a spark of good faith. We have that now. I mean, you know, it's not classified anymore. Even without WikiLeaks, I was able to get this and you know, tell you about it. Um, it's actually quoted in a book by Robert Kagan called Dangerous Nation. And virtually everybody viewed the United States in this way, including the Spanish, the French, the Russians, and the British. French diplomats called the American populace warlike and restless. Shortly after, that same framework was applied by the North to the American South. It was a lazy, do-nothing society sitting in the way of progress. As I discuss, and there's a chapter on it in uh, Why America Failed. Um, and um, it was not northern opposition to slavery that triggered the Civil War. Uh, later on, obviously, it became a, an important unifying theme or rallying cry. And I have to say that, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm sure that critics of the book will say that I'm pro-slavery or something. You know, I, I just, I can see it now, you know, really. Um, but um, these people are not that bright. And, you know, they're not into nuance. Not, not, not their thing. Um, but uh, it could well be argued that without the war, slavery would have con continued for several decades more. Probably that's the case, although some historians have argued it's not true. But the more fundamental conflict was a clash of cultures. It was the slow, easy way of the South, as opposed to the restless economic expansion of the North. Both sides regarded the other as the devil incarnate, and the result was the loss of 625,000 lives and a massive destruction of the South, epitomized by Sherman's march to the sea, which was violent beyond belief. Those scars still exist. As far as the South goes, the war is not really over. You just have to travel through the South to see that. Um, the resentment runs very deep, and it's because their way of life was never acknowledged as having any validity at all. You know. The Germans were next, although that's an opposition that seems thoroughly justified. We got that one right. You know, so. And then the godless communists, of course. The conversion of the Russians from ally to enemy occurred almost overnight. And it isn't difficult to see why. With the Axis powers out of the picture, there had to be an enemy in place to fill the resulting vacuum. And although the USSR as a regime was quite repressive, we all know that, it did not, as George Kennan was later to argue, have to be cast as the ultimate enemy because its real goal was in securing its borders. That was really it. Um, KGB files that came open after the fall of the Soviet Union revealed that Russia's real fear was not of the United States, but of a rearmed Germany. That was really the major thing in their minds that they were scared about. However, there was no attempt to negotiate anything with Russia. As Stalin pointed out as early as 1946, for the Americans, negotiation actually meant capitulation. That was the American idea of negotiation. For the other side, simply lie down and roll over. Um, in any case, the Cold War kept the United States busy for decades, and the so-called perimeter defense, which held that any disturbance in the world was a cause for U.S. military action, led to the disasters of Iran, Guatemala, Vietnam, Chile, and so on. A long and unhappy list, well documented by Stephen Kinzer of the New York Times and William Blum in his book, Killing Hope. Of course, the psychological structure of negative identity led to a crisis when the Soviet Union finally collapsed. Suddenly, we had no one to define ourselves against. The Gulf War of 91 helped fill the gap for a time, but the Clinton years were largely meaningless. Without an enemy, we had no idea of who we were, so we filled the space with O.J. Simpson and Monica Lewinsky. And that sort of kept us busy, you know, for several years. Finally, the Islamic world did us the greatest favor imaginable. It attacked us. <laughs> and um, overnight, terrorism replaced communism as the crucial buzzword. Bush Jr., like Reagan, in characterizing the Soviet Union, said this is the ultimate evil. It's a contest between good and evil. It's a crusade. Not a good word to use if you're talking to the Arab world. And um, there was no possible discussion of American foreign policy in the Middle East as having played a role in these events. In fact, you know, the notion was tantamount to treason. Susan Sontag, who said it 
in the New Yorker shortly after, lost her job. And uh, you, even today, you can't talk in those terms, you know. Um, these people are evil and insane, end of discussion. They're savages. To this day, under the Obama administration, you should be aware your tax dollars pay for workshops that teach the police and the military that Islam is an evil religion out to destroy America and which must therefore be destroyed first. If you don't believe me, I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you don't believe me, go to truthdig.com, Chris Hedges' column of May 9th of this year, in which he names names who are giving these workshops, how much they're receiving, uh, to whom he's giving these workshops, what's the funding, all that's all there. You know. Once again, civilization and the savages. That's the, that's the model. Kennan tried to warn the American government that making a monolith out of communism was a big mistake, that there were huge conflicts, for example, between Russia and China. But since Manichaeanism requires cardboard figures, American presidents from Truman on paid no attention to his advice. A similar thing now exists with respect to Islam. It turns out that only about 10% of American Islams are actually religious. In this sense, they're like the Jews. It's basically social. You go to the mosque, you meet people, and that's really what it's about. Um, and of the 10% that are religious, the tiniest minority are jihadists. You know. But when your identity is a, is a negative one in the Hegelian sense, this type of nuance has to be kept out of everyone's consciousness. For example, Americans tend to regard Pakistan as a dark and awful place, the country that hid Osama bin Laden and protected him from, you know, from American troops and so on, or that harbors uh, al-Qaeda operatives, hence our drone strikes in that country, which uh, mostly kill civilians, you know, making the president really a, a war criminal, basically. Um, or that it's in league with the Taliban and so on. What would Americans say if they read in the newspapers, and you can't in American newspapers, it's just that last June I happened to be in London, um, and uh, I picked up a copy of The Guardian, and there was an article about a very popular TV show in Pakistan that's of a, a run by a sort of John Stewart type comedian. And um, he pokes fun at the government and at Muslim fundamentalism. You know, I mean, one would not think that. Um, he hosts um, groups, there's one group that has a song called Burka Woman, which is based on Roy Orbison's song, you know, Pretty Woman. And it's the same music, you know, so they, the song goes, Pretty Woman, Burka Woman, walking down the street, Burka Woman with your sexy feet, because that's all you can see, you know, like that, you know. I mean, this not, did not get picked up by the American press, you know, um, because basically, it, it complicates the picture. Then the enemy's not totally black, you see. Um, and uh, it, it would open up a questioning of who we are beyond the nation in opposition to something, and that means the game would be up, so we don't want that. Marshall McLuhan once wrote that all forms of violence are quests for identity. I love that line. All forms of violence are quests for identity. More recently, David Shulman, who's professor of humanities at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, wrote, there is nothing more precious than an enemy, especially one whom you have largely created by your own acts and who plays some necessary role in the inner drama of your soul. Boy, does that characterize an awful lot of what's going on, you know? Um, what is the American soul? Do we actually have one? Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Beyond opposition, what defines the United States? This emptiness of the, at the center makes our quest for identity especially violent, especially acute. Um, the policy we pursue is always one of scorched earth, of shock and awe. That's, that's how we handle things. So that means, at least to me, that in the fullness of time, it was we who proved to be the savages, not the savages. Um, it's interesting that the theme of Paul Auster's novels, if you've read any of his stuff, is that American society is incoherent, that it lacks a true identity, and that it's nothing more than a hall of mirrors. He's been saying that for decades, and by and large, Americans don't know who Paul Auster is, and they don't read him. Uh, Auster is tremendously popular in Europe. He's been translated into more than 20 languages. Those are the bulk of his sales. Americans are not interested in this kind of perception. 
Criticism is not possible in a Manichaean world, of course, and the U.S. is very good at marginalizing writers who attempt to write a critique of the country in a fundamental way. Um, overt censorship as a result is not really necessary. I get this question all the time when I talk in Latin America. Especially. Well, aren't your work censored? I said, there's no need for it. The, the flood of information is so huge, how am I going to even get noticed, you know? I mean, they would be, it would be like, you know, a sledgehammer to kill a fly. Why would they even bother, you know? Famous last words, but, yeah. <laughs> um, the um, result is that, as in the famous Goya painting, which you, if you go to Madrid, go to the Prado, Saturn devouring his son. It's a great, Saturno devorando su hijo. It's really powerful, 1818. So it's really a horrifying painting. You have, you have to see this. But the United States is now imploding. It's now in eating itself alive. That's what's been going on. Um, I argued this in Dark Ages America in 2006. The data for this has, that have accumulated since then are quite enormous. There is not a single American institution that is not seriously corrupt. I could document this for hours, but again, you've got other things to do. Let me just cite a few examples. First, Ronald Dworkin, one of America's leading intellectuals, did an essay a few months ago in the New York Review of Books showing that the Supreme Court has become a court of men and not of laws. In the case of five out of the nine justices, he says, decisions are made in advance in a right-wing political direction, and then the justification for the decisions is trotted out after the fact, even though it often violates the Constitution. Well, what kind of a court is this? It's a kangaroo court. Uh, number two, in the book Academically Adrift, sociologists Richard Aram and Josipa Roxa report that after two years of college, 45% of American students haven't learned anything, and after four years, 36% haven't learned anything. <laughs> including, including in what they didn't learn is any kind of critical, analytical, reasoning, ability, skills. They don't have it. They don't know what the difference is between an argument and an opinion, and they don't know what evidence is. They literally have no idea. You know. um, half the students, most of the students when asked, defined their college experience as social rather than academic or intellectual. That was what they were there for, to meet people, make friends, get laid, drink a lot of alcohol, and so on and so forth. Um, half the students in the study said they hadn't taken a single course in the previous semester that required more than 20 pages of writing. A third said they hadn't taken a course requiring more than 40 pages of reading. What were they doing? You know, watching videos? I mean, no idea. Um, a Marist poll released July 4th of this year showed that 42% of American adults are unaware that the U.S. declared its independence in 1776. 42%. And when you go to the below 30 age group, it rises to 69%. 25% okay. um, of Americans don't know from which country the United States seceded. Bulgaria? You know, <laughs> Ghana? When? A recent Newsweek poll revealed that 73% of Americans can't give the official version of why we fought the Cold War, let alone the real version, but they can't give the official version of that, and 44% are unable to say what the Bill of Rights is. A poll taken in the Oklahoma public school system, this just a few months ago, turned up the fact that 77% of the students didn't know who George Washington was, 77%. In a number of cities, libraries have closed for lack of funding, but I also think it's probably for lack of interest. I mean, who wants to bother with books? So last January, one serious presidential candidate praised the founding fathers for, quote, working tirelessly to abolish slavery. <laughs> now, it turns out that these founding fathers declared that a black person legally constituted 60% of a human being, and they enshrined slavery in the Constitution. Uh, this person also claimed that the United States government was colluding with the Chinese to abolish the dollar. And um, on August 18th, after her straw poll victory in Iowa, she asserted that the American people are, present tense, concerned about the rise of the Soviet Union. I was puzzled that she didn't mention Hitler. <laughs> I'm, I understand that he's poised to invade Poland at any moment, you know. Um, the uh, um, 
this person, I mean, Michelle Bachman, is essentially a dimwit. In the recent GOP debates, presidential GOP debates, uh, she made the statement, uh, uh, Obama has invaded Libya, and now he's thinking of moving on to Africa. <laughs> Where did she think Libya was? In Northern Europe? You know. The interesting thing is not that she's a nutcase. The interesting thing is that millions, millions of people regard her as presidential material. Yeah. They are your neighbors, folks. They, you, when you go to borrow a cup of sugar, you're talking to them. You know, they're, you're, they're your neighbors. You know. This is not in some hinterland. This is you know, right here, right here. Um, the new high school curriculum in American history in Texas uh, does not have any units on Washington, Adams, or Thomas Jefferson, but it does have a study unit on a stay louder. When I, you know, it was like reading The Onion, you know, that satire. <laughs> when I first read that, I said, oh, this is a joke, this is a joke. But satire has become reality in the United States. I looked more closely. I mean, I saw it, I think, in Common Dreams. I looked more closely. That article appeared in the Austin Statesman. I mean, it really is true, you know. And I've been thinking of, you know, writing a uh, letter to the Board of Education in Texas suggesting that... Uh, they eliminate the unit on Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which I'm sure they don't have anyway, um, and uh, putting in a major unit on Kim Kardashian, you know. <laughs> and you laugh, but it's only a couple of years away. Not. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, this satire becomes reality in the United States. Why not? I mean, uh, you go to CNN.com, and there are articles about Kim's rear end, her psoriasis, uh, her wedding, her divorce. Why, why not? When, you know, if Estee Lauder can make it, I don't see why Kim should be excluded. Anyway, um, this factor of the stupidity of the American public, again, is not something that Michael Moore, Chomsky, and the others point out because it's politically incorrect and it's very impolite to say it. But I did find one besides me, <laughs> a political scientist named Philip Green who did an article this year called Farewell to Democracy um, in which he wrote, what has seized a critical mass of Americans is historical amnesia and intellectual vacuity. The result is a politics of social self-destruction. What could be more obvious, really, really? Three, in the aftermath of the crash of 2008, the very people who promulgated the ideology that led to the crash got appointed the president's economic advisors. The fox now guards the hen house. Lawrence Summers, Timothy Geithner, Ben Bernanke, the whole crowd. Not a single Wall Street financial leader has faced jail. Major corporate figures who brought the economy down were in fact awarded huge bonuses. Some secured prestigious appointments at places such as Johns Hopkins University and the Brookings Institution. I couldn't get a job as a janitor at the Brookings Institution. I mean, let's be clear about that. Meanwhile, the very practices that led to the crash, such as derivatives, credit default swaps, and all that sort of stuff, are now being pursued with more, more vigor than they were prior to the crash. It's not that, you know, they, oh, we can't do this because it, no, no. You know, it's, it's more of the same. Paul Krugman asks somewhat rhetorically, how is it that in the wake of the obvious failure of casino capitalism and neoliberalism, the blame for the crash is not put on the banks, which receive finally bailouts of roughly $19 trillion and the corporations, but on the public sector. So you have the crash because of the private sector and all the blame directed out to the government. Fourth, between 1987 and 2007, the number of Americans that are so disabled by mental disorders that they qualified for supplementary so security income or social security disability insurance increased 2.5 times, so that one out of every six Americans now falls into this category. For children, the increase is 35 times during the same period. That's our future. Um, Mental illness is now the leading cause of disability among the child population of the United States. A survey of American adults conducted by the National Institute of Mental Health over 2001-2003 found that 46% of them met the criteria of the American Psychiatric Association for being mentally ill. 10% of Americans over the age of six now take antidepressants. Actually, it stretches back to at least age four now. Toddlers are taking Prozac. Um, and I read elsewhere that in terms of the global market, in terms of volumes of sales, American sum consumption of antidepressants is two-thirds of the entire world's consumption. 
So here's a country with less than 5% of the world's population taking 67% of the antidepressant drugs. This has got to tell you something about the United States. Okay. Um, some time ago, uh, actually, as a friend of mine in, in England when I was there, um, uh, she is an art consultant. She lived for many years in New York City. And she bought a plaque when she was there. I don't know. So, so there's no Woolworths, but it was a store like Woolworths. And the plaque says, Evenings at 7 in the Parish Hall. That's the title. And underneath it, um, it says, Monday, alcoholics. Tuesday, abuse spouses. Wednesday, eating disorders. Thursday, drug addiction. Friday, teen suicide. Saturday, soup kitchen. And then finally, the Sunday sermon at 9 a.m., America's joyous future. <laughs> Yes, we have some joyous future coming up. Five, the infrastructure in the United States is crumbling and there's no money to fix it. Also, in some cases, ideological opposition to fixing it is very strong. Uh, apparently, the levees of New Orleans are in the same shape now that they were before Katrina. Okay? I read an article some time ago about the attempt to address this. Now, I don't know whether it was on the municipal level of New Orleans or the state level, I can't remember exactly, and I didn't save the article. But the councilman stated that they did not want to move on it because it would require a cooperative effort, and this, they said, meant socialism. <laughs> so apparently, working together is equivalent to socialism, and it's better to risk another Katrina than to have that. You know, hmm, hmm. Boy, it doesn't get dumber than that. You know, I mean, it's, it's limit. Number six. The national debt now stands at more than $14 trillion. Uh, the official figure for poverty and hunger is 45 million citizens, but in fact, that's based on criteria that are pretty much obsolete. Um, in fact, something like 200 million Americans live from paycheck to paycheck if they can get a job. As far as that goes, it's, don't believe those figures about 9% unemployment. It's close to 20. In real, in real figures. And this is verified by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. If you go to the website of the U.S. You know, US Department of Labor, you'll find it. It's like 18%. Um, which means that one out of five Americans are out of work, and economists say there's little chance they're going to find it for, excuse me, another 10 years. You know, not, a, not a rosy prospect. Seven, the president now has the right, although it violates the Geneva Accords, to designate any American citizen, or actually anyone on the planet, an enemy, and have him or her assassinated. In fact, that recently happened on September 30th. Uh, Obama had two American citizens, Anwar al and Samir Khan, murdered. You know? And one can say, you know, well, they were al-Qaeda supporters and so on. First of all, that's not proven. And the second thing is, so what if they were? The Constitution says you have a right to have your day in court, not a right to get rubbed out, you know. And there's no uh, worry about that on the part of uh, the government. And furthermore, American citizens don't care. You know, they don't, it doesn't make any difference to them. Um, in an essay entitled America's Disappeared, this was posted on Truth Dig, 18 July, Chris Hedges writes, torture, prolonged detention without trial, sexual humiliation, rape, disappearance, extortion, looting, random murder, and abuse have become, as in Argentina during the Dirty War, part of our own subterranean world of detention sites and torture centers. We know of at least 100 detainees who died during interrogation at our black sites. There are probably many more whose fate has never been made public. Tens of thousands of Muslim men have passed through our clandestine detention centers without due process. We tortured people unmercifully, admitted retired General Barry McCaffrey. We probably murdered dozens of them, both the, armed, uh, both the armed forces and the CIA. So tens of thousands of Americans are being held in super maximum security prisons now where they're deprived of contact with anyone and psychologically destroyed. Undocumented workers are rounded up and they vanish from their families for weeks or months. Militarized police units break down the doors of some 40,000 Americans every year and haul them away in the dead of night as though they were enemy combatants. And of course, as you know, habeas corpus no longer exists. Once again, Philip Green comments on this. A people that accepts as a normal course of, excuse me, as a normal course of events, the bombing of civilians, 
torture, kidnapping, indefinite detention, assassinations, secret governments at home, and covert wars abroad has lost touch with the moral basis of civil society. Good description of us today, I think. Eight, the U.S. military, which soaks up 50% of the discretionary budget, is un apparently unable to win two wars in two small countries. In fact, it has not had a serious victory since World War II, after which it decided to play it safe and stick to tin pot dictators and minor nations. Number nine, a U.S. intelligence report released in 2008 called Global Trends 2025, you can download it on the web, predicts a steady decline in American dominance over the coming decades with U.S. leadership eroding, quote, at an accelerating pace in political, economic, and cultural arenas. To my knowledge, the President has never mentioned this report, nor has anyone in public office. Ten, on July 19th of 2010, the Washington Post reported that 854,000 people work for the National Security Agency, the NSA, in 33 building complexes amounting to 17 million square feet of space in the D.C. metro area. Every day, collection systems at the NSA intercept and store 1.7 billion emails and phone calls of American citizens in what amounts to a vast domestic spy system. Writing in The New Yorker on May 23rd of this year, Jane Meyer reported that the NSA has three times the budget of the CIA and has the capacity to download every six hours electronic communications equivalent to the entire contents of the Library of Congress every six hours. They also developed a program called Thin Thread that enables computers to scan the material for keywords. And they collect the billing records and the dialed phone numbers of everyone in the country. In violation of communications laws, AT&T, Verizon, and Bell South were only too happy to open their electronic records to the government. I have to say that at the height of its insanity, uh, the Stasi in East Germany, you know that film, uh, Leben des Anderes, uh, Lives of others, yeah, yeah. Um, was spying out of one out of, on one out of every seven citizens. The United States is now spying on seven out of every seven citizens. Everybody in this room, your emails, your phone calls, it's all recorded. Eleven, you can now go to jail in the United States simply for speaking. In late July of this year, environmental activist Tim DeChristopher was sentenced to two years in prison for his repeated declaration that environmental protection required civil, that is to say nonviolent, disobedience. One wonders if the same judge, D. Benson, would have also put Rosa Parks and Mahatma Gandhi in jail had she been, he been around during their lifetimes. Number 12, this is my favorite. This was also in July of this year. Uh, somehow this was symbolic, it seemed to me, of what's happened to America in the last 60 years. Police in Georgia shut down a lemonade stand being run by three girls, aged 10 to 14, who were trying to save up money for a trip to a local water park. Um, the police said that they didn't know what was in the lemonade. Acid trips. Right? <laughs> and in addition, that the girls needed a business license, a peddler's permit, and a food permit in order to run the stand. It turns out that the permits cost $50 a day. You know, so Kind of uh, counterproductive as far as the girls were concerned. Um, and finally, Baker's Dozen, number 13, the deepest locus of corruption, it seems to me, is the American soul. Um, the sheer cruelty of the American people that now is starting to fill many articles. Um, I have to say, again, it's a question of macro macrocosm and microcosm. On page 56 of Why America Failed, I wrote, as George Walden writes in his aptly titled study, God Won't Save America, Psychosis of a Nation, quote, the peculiarities of nations, good and bad, tend to reflect the temperaments and qualities of their peoples. As Plato remarked, where else would they have come from? And at that point, when my editor, this, you know, several months ago, was working over the manuscript, at this point he wrote in the margin, this is the turning point of the book. You know, this is it. This is the hinge point of the whole thing. Um, so, you know, as far as um, evidence for that goes, um, the uh, Jonathan Shell did an article in The Nation October 17th talking about um, some of the meetings for uh, Republican candidates 
uh, Ron Paul had a, uh, apparently said something like uh, he would recommend that uh, anybody um, uh, who who got sick and didn't have health insurance, uh, you know, it's his risk after all. And Wolf Blitzer asked him, so so he should just die, and uh, that was the implication. And uh, there were cheers from the crowd at this point. They roared in approval. Um, they also applauded enthusiastically when uh, uh, Rick Perry, you know, reported that he had killed 200, the state of Texas had murdered 235 criminals on death row. Uh, that, that also brought, you know, enthusiastic cheers. Um, the, uh, there's so much of this, uh, this material now. Uh, most recently, uh, there was an article in the New York Times about a law firm, Stephen J. Baum, located near Buffalo, New York. Uh, it's commonly referred to as a foreclosure mill firm. It does the dirty work for banks, you know, and evicting people and so on. And a year ago, Halloween, 2010, they had a Halloween party, and the staff showed up with their costumes being homeless people. They dressed as the people that they themselves evicted. Here are the pictures, you know. I mean, so the people, you know, dirtied their faces and they had signs, we'll work for food and stuff. This was funny to them. This was funny. Of course, the firm immediately denied it, but the pictures are online. You know, I mean, you know, deny away. Um, it seems to me, I mean, as far as the data for this goes, this is anecdotal evidence, but uh, the University of Michigan began a study on empathy among college students in 1979. It ran for 30 years, and the conclusion was that there was a 48% drop in empathy among college students and an inability to understand another person's point of view. Um, Douglas LeBeer, who is a therapist in Washington, D.C., calls this empathy deficit disorder, which he says is rife in, in the United States. After all, Capital punishment is regarded as barbaric in Europe. 38 states in the U.S. have it with great support on the part of the population. And when somebody's executed, crowds typically show up with signs and say, die, you son of a bitch, and things like this, you know. Uh, anyway, let me stop at 13 examples. It's probably quite enough. But, you know, just want to say that uh, it seems to me that a harsh environment, which is the environment we live in, uh, creates cruel people. Although he doesn't get into the issue of negative identity per se, the French writer Denis Duclos, who is a director of the CNRS, the Research Institute in Paris, um, pegged the problem of the obsession with having an enemy and the violence that results from that in his book of 1994, Le Complexe de Lougarou, The Werewolf Complex. In his epilogue to the 2005 edition, Duclos writes that America is always dependent on a werewolf figure a dark, savage beast that's out to destroy it. And the beast, he says, changes in content, but the form is always the same. At the center of this, he says, is a terrible fear that Americans have of emptiness, which is an anxiety of not existing. And they disguise this with a hyperactive optimism. Have a nice day. A curious society, he writes, of people who don't know who they really are. Like the Romans, they see themselves under siege, and he says this could finally trigger a fascist populism, which, of course, we're seeing with the Tea Party. The American fear of the monster, he writes, has always marked its history, whether this exists on the inside or the outside. This leads to isolating the country in a sort of collective psychosis that can only contribute to international instability. In fact, that's how most of the world sees us. A few years ago, there was an international poll that asked the question, which nation do you believe is the greatest threat to world peace? The United States and Israel said Iran, and everybody else said the United States. Writing in Der Spiegel last August, the German journalist Jakob Augstein argues that the United States is basically a failed state. It's not part of the West anymore, and that Europe needs to keep its distance from what is a very different and apparently, his word, insane political culture. There is, he concludes, no deliverance in sight for the U.S. Some time ago, I got an email from a fan who wrote, I just read The Twilight of American Culture and Dark Ages America. I want to thank you for your brilliant and pointless books. <laughs> now, I found this comment quite hilarious. 
because I felt the guy was right. Uh, the books are pointless in that they have no ability to change anything whatsoever. One wonders why I even bother. You know, really. you know I got nothing better to do but sit in my study. Right? You know. um, what does mental health mean in an individual case? It's at least this, that a person knows his or her personal narrative and is able to see it from the outside and a result, as a result of this transparency, at least try to do something about it. Um, perhaps the same thing is true of a nation or a civilization, I don't know, but what I know is that there's very little understanding in the United States as to what the underlying narrative is or even the fact that there is an underlying narrative. This seems to escape most Americans, almost all. There's also very little interest in thinking about national identity or lack of same in anything more than a superficial way, which is provided, for example, by the New York Times. In such a situation, change is simply not possible. The odds that we're going to continue on this unconscious path are overwhelming. We saw it with the 10th anniversary of 9-11. It was still a repeat of this happened from the outside. We didn't do anything. We never you know, overthrew the regime of Mohammed Mossadegh in 1953 in Iran that led to this endless uh, Islamic re resentment of us. Oh no, they had nothing to do with it. You know. In that sense, my work is indeed pointless. I mean, I'm a writer and social critic. I can't stop the plane from crashing. Nobody can. But I'm rather like the engineer who surveys the wreckage and locates the black box and takes it apart and writes up the report, the post-mortem. And that, I believe, does have some small value because finally we need to know why America failed. Thank you very much. <clears throat> There's a great myth in the United States of the self-made man or person. And um, this is always held up as, you know, if you're entrepreneurial enough, or entrepreneurial enough, you can be like Bill Gates or whatever, or God forbid, Oprah Winfrey. Um, and uh, the thing is that by 1850, 4% uh, of the New York population owned 50% of the wealth of that city. And so all the studies that have been made are that this lopsidedness of control has been a major feature and that almost very, very few Americans escaped the social class into which they were born. So there's a mythology behind it. The question is, uh, we tend to vilify the enemy, uh, whoever that is. Is there something uh, special about the US that creates that pattern? And I would say yes, for the reasons that Marshall McLuhan said. Violence reflects the search for identity. We don't know who we are. We never did. And the notion that we were Republican or anti-monarchical, uh, those ideals of the 18th century uh, really blew away like dandelion spores by the time the War of Independence was over, you know. Um, it's, the United States has always been, I mean, this is the theme of why America failed, it has always been a hustling culture. And basically, if your goal in life is more, then you have no goal. Because once you have more, then there's always more. <laughs> you know, it never ends. So who are we and what are we doing? And once you have that kind of emptiness at the center, you're going to be quite violent. And it's why, and de Tocqueville talked about this in Democracy in America. He said, um, Americans are really strange. They live in a perpetual state of self-adoration. You know, they're always saying how fabulous they are. And he said, if you challenge that, they get very fierce very quickly. You know, this is 1831, you know, not, not too bad, not too shabby a, a, an assessment. The question was, I must have some observations about how we're going to get out of this mess. And my answer was, you leave the mess. That's what I did. I would encourage everybody to do that. I get letters on my blog uh, regularly, especially from young people. What should I do? And I say, what do you think is waiting for you 30 or 40 years down the line when there's no Social Security, no Medicare, no social safety net whatsoever, and we are making yet another war on some Fercacta country on the other side of the planet and spending trillions of dollars to do that, whoever they are, and if we run out of countries, we're going to invade Antarctica and clean up those communistic penguins that are creating problems. There's no end to this. We don't know how to do anything else. And the chance that we have, quite honestly, of turning this around are roughly the chances that we have
or would have, of turning around an aircraft carrier in a bathtub. So quite frankly, um, not only is there no way out, but I would recommend you get out. Things will only get worse in the United States, and frankly, they could get very ugly. They could get quite nasty. Uh, there are already signs of that. This cruelty that I talked about is quite endemic. And um, I think that it's not that unusual to think that um, maybe 10, 15 years from now, a book like this couldn't be sold, couldn't be published. You know, uh, I did submit it to 13, my, my agent submitted it to 13 publishers, 12 turned it down. Three of those said, this is too hot for us to handle. They were honest. The rest came up with answers that I had to decode, you know, because they do a little song and dance, you know. But it was either it was too hot to handle or it was we can't make enough money on this. It's not commercially viable. It was interesting because a number of these that turned it down used adjectives to describe the book like groundbreaking, wonderful was what one publisher said. We're going to pass on it. So you mean if it, if it was less wonderful, then you'd publish it? You know, I should have made it less wonderful, you know. Um, so as time goes on, uh, who knows what's going to happen? The Occupy Wall Street movement is an interesting thing to consider. But the general tendency in the United States, as far as revolution goes, is that it would occur from the right, not from the left. And uh, I don't think that's too far-fetched and uh, makes me edgy, you know, I have to say. But, you know, I mean... I don't have a crystal ball, you know. Just. The question is, not everybody can leave the United States. What if you do if you're trapped here? What if you do if you can't get out? Um, I did answer that in the first book in the series, The Twilight of American Culture. Yeah, right. Basically, look, there are three possibilities. One is that, the, that you could change the country, turn totally upside down. That's not a possibility. The second is that you leave, okay. The third is, if you can't, you have to do a kind of inner emigration. And that's what the monastic option was about. In other words, you have to find on a local basis, which I never was able to do, you have to find on a local basis communities, groups, grassroots organizations, study groups, whatever it is, that enable you to work toward the preservation of what's good in the culture, and then you take your chances in terms of what's going to happen.